thanks for joining us. Welcome everyone to today's webinar, The GDPR, Your Questions Answered. I'd like to introduce our presenter. Joining us today is Scott Giordano, Vice President of Data Protection at Spirian. Scott's a highly regarded data privacy attorney with over 20 years of experience. Welcome, Scott. Please take it away. Wonderful. Thank you, Abby. And good morning and good afternoon to everyone on the call. So, GDPR, your questions answered. If you have questions, send them in. I will hit them all if possible. If I don't get to your question, we will put it up on the blog within um, seven days or so, hopefully sooner. And also, this will be available, this presentation as well. So, if you leave with nothing else, a couple things I want to share with you. Complaints from data subjects are the most likely cause of investigations by supervisory authorities or GPAs, whatever you want to call them. I'll talk a little bit more about this in a minute. The net net of it is that you really want to have a good capability to communicate with data subjects. If they believe that you're not responding to them for whatever reason, they're going to go to the supervisory authority like the Information Commissioner's Office or the CNEEL or what have you. So to short circuit that, really make sure you have a good mechanism to address complaints from data subjects. Secondly, take breach notification seriously. And I say that because I've done so much work with clients in the past and they say, oh yeah, we've got great incident response capability. We're very good at X, whether X is getting the bad guys out of the network or what have you. And that misses the point. Breach notification is a whole different discipline than incident response. So it's all about the legalities. It's about notifying the authorities, about notifying persons affected, notifying the public in general, and then, of course, your insurance company, if that's relevant. So it's a different discipline. It's going to require working with legal and a couple other folks. So it's something that you really want to take seriously. It's just not enough to say we've got a great incident response program. That's not going to cut it. To that point, legal and compliance are going to be involved in everything we talk about today in some capacity, and in typically they get brought in way too late in the process to fix things if things go wrong. So please do, if you have colleagues in legal and compliance departments, get them involved in any kind of GDPR remediation projects you're working on or efforts, or if there's an incident, whatever it is, get them involved early and often, as it were, because they're going to be needed to be involved anyway. And unfortunately, and again, this is my own experience, a lot of times in the past, I've been called at the last minute to go fix things, and by that time, it's too late. So do get them involved early if possible. And then finally, your data inventory. You know, I'm a big fan of data inventory. Is make sure that you are working on that, not just for GDPR and for updating that for GDPR purposes and making that an evergreen project, but also for now the upcoming CCPA and other states. Uh, I'll have a, a future webinar on all the state data privacy laws that are rolling out as we speak right now. So with that, let's go and start answering your questions. These are all questions either that you've emailed me already or that I got when I was working on projects. So first question coming in, do we really need to report all breaches? And the short answer is yes, unless the personal data breach is unlikely to result in a risk to the rights and freedoms of natural persons. So we'll come back to that issue in a minute. But what's important here is that there was roughly 200,000 investigations in the first eight or so months uh, opened up by DPAs and supervisory authorities um, based on GDPR, almost half. So 45% were related to complaints, about a third were initiated on the basis of a breach notification. So that's why it's important. One is the importance of, of addressing breaches just in the abstract. Two, you can see that complaints are even higher in terms of, of generating these reports or these investigations. But three, it's important to get a grasp on the fact that breach notification is just going to be a normal business process. And having a routinized process that is repeatable, it's defensible, that you can keep doing it constantly as breaches come in, because it's going to happen. Being able to have that set is crucial. In terms of determining whether it's a risk to the rights or freedoms of a natural person, I've got two answers here. One is that yes, that's true. If it's not likely to result in it, then you don't have to report. Reality is that determining what's a risk to a right and freedom, well, first up, what is a, a risk to a right and freedom? Well, if you look in the, in the final bullet here, you can see under Recital 75, it talks about things like discrimination or identity theft or fraud or financial loss, damage to your reputation, et cetera. Here's the problem, is that how do you quantify that? How do you know if a breach you have is going to lead to that? And the answer is you don't know. 
there are some breaches that are obvious, and, and I've used this example before because it's so poignant, but you remember some years ago when there was the Ashley Madison hack and all those people that were involved in that, their information was made public. Obviously, that's a huge issue and super easy to say, yep, that's a breach we've got to report. But in other cases, it's vague. Suppose that you have information about someone's movements. Maybe it's GPS locations or things they purchased, but you don't have their identity per se. Is, is that enough to say, you know what? Yeah, that's a, a danger to a right and freedom because someone connected us. It's a tough question. That's why I tend to default to always say, yes, just report a breach unless there's some compelling reason not to. It's just too hard to say, yes, this is a, damn, a risk to rights and freedoms based upon what was stolen because you just don't know how clever bad guys are. There are some cases where, for example, Equifax, data was stolen and there's no indication that any fraud took place, which leads me to believe that this was done by a state actor, not by just a regular bad guy. Still, that being the case, though, now a bad state in some country has got this data and they potentially could do far worse things than your garden variety criminal. So the net net of it is that it's a hard decision to say what's a danger to a right and freedom to a natural person. I would default to having a bias, if you will, to reporting breaches. Abby, I'm going to do a full stop there. Any questions coming in before we start rolling through the next ones? Uh, no questions at this time, Scott. Okay. All right. So let's go to the next slide here. I'll talk a little bit more about rights and freedoms in the context of a data protection impact assessment, because sometimes I get the question, well, I hear about rights and freedoms for breaches. I hear rights and freedoms for DPIAs. Are they the same thing? The short answer is not necessarily. And what you see here is WP248. This is the guide for conducting data protection impact assessments. You've probably done one by now, I'm imagining. If not, you likely will be using it to do one. It's a great document. I highly recommend it. They've got different criteria for why something may be a risk to a right and freedom. And in fact, you can see the nine criteria here. I'm not going to dig too deeply into them, but if two or more of these are present in your processing, it's likely a risk that merits a data protection impact assessment, which means that it merits investigation into mitigating technologies or controls, et cetera. The point is that you should use this as a guide to say, hey, our processing incorporates evaluation or scoring. So that's number one. It incorporates data process on a large scale, however defined. Likely that any database that merits a DPIA, if there's a breach, you can almost guarantee it's going to merit having breach notification. So while it's not an exact one-to-one -one mapping, why you would necessarily say it's something's a risk from a breach perspective versus DPI perspective, it's a good guide and I would definitely use it. I spent a lot of time reading this document and rereading it and I highly recommend it if you have not had a chance. Okay, let's go to the next slide. We'll talk some more here about the, these are questions that have come up. Either you guys have emailed me or I've got them on projects I've worked on. Is a ransomware attack considered a breach? Uh, the short answer is potentially, and I can't give you something definitive here. The Article 29 Working Party, which is European Data Protection Board, in WP250, which is a, a white paper on the larger subject, of data protection talked about this idea that if you've got infected by ransomware, it could lead to a temporary loss of availability that has to be restored by a backup. Now, what's interesting here is that under GDPR, a loss of access really has a much bigger ability to merit a breach notification than we would have here in the United States. I think it's an interesting dichotomy, and maybe I'll talk about it in a future webcast, but the net net of it is that because of the way they define the CIA triad, they've actually added resiliency to that triad. So the implication is that because they're expecting you to have a lot of resiliency, if you get hit by ransomware and you can't restore things fairly quickly, you can pretty much guarantee it's a, a breachable or reportable breach, if you will. So here it says notification could be required if the incident is qualified as a confidentiality breach, meaning that um, bad guys have gotten personal data. And this presents a risk to the rights and freedoms. You can see why I'm talking about this subject of rights and freedoms, because it, it, it shows up with some regularity. Now, contrast that with, interestingly, here with the Department of Health and Human Services. They say if there's a ransomware attack and uh, you get essentially ransomware, it's a breach and it's reportable full stop. So they say here the presence of ransomware or any malware on a covered entities or BA's uh, computer system is an incident under the security rule. 
and there's a link there to the, the document that cites that. So I use that as a contrast here. I really recommend you guys take a look at the document, even if you're not in the, in the healthcare business. I think that they've got the better of the philosophy here, that if you get hit by ransomware, you can pretty much presume the bad guys have gotten the confidentiality part already covered, and it's a reportable offense. Let us go to the next slide. Okay, this one, what happens when a data processor claims to be a data controller? I've gotten this many, many times when I was inside council previously, and this is really more of a political issue than a legal one. So I'll give you an example. You work with a travel agency. These guys are notorious for this. They'll say, even though I'm your data processor, I'm also a co-controller, or I'm just a controller of personal information. Um, and the question is, do you have to put up with this, quote unquote? And the short answer is, it depends. Frankly, I had many, many heated discussions with processors who said, oh, we're a data controller. And I could never understand why they wanted to be a data controller, except they wanted to take the data and do something with it outside of my view that is something they want to either sell to a third party or they want to do some kind of analysis, what have you. So the, the net net of it is that, that there's no reason for a controller or, I'm sorry, a processor to, to want to be a data controller, okay, in my view. Again, so if they're a processor, they're, they wouldn't get the data but for your having a relationship with them. And that's the example that I've used many cases, this but for test. And I've, I've told the processors, look, if not but for our hiring you to process this data, you wouldn't have it. And so they shrug their shoulders and they say, well, yeah, so what? But the point is that if they wouldn't have the data in the first place, there's no argument from their perspective they should be a controller. So this is a huge political issue. It's not per se a legal one in the sense that the GDPR is going to say one thing or another. If they want to be a controller, then they're going to have to take co-responsibility for things that go wrong. I don't understand the attraction, why processors want to say they're controllers. So but I've dealt with it consistently, and this is a question I get with some regularity. So the net net of it is get your legal counsel involved in this, and you're probably going to be butting heads with the processor. If it's a big one and you can't do without them, you're likely going to be out of luck on this. So the next bullet here, does the right to be forgotten, so also known as the right to erasure, apply to backup tapes? This is still an unknown. So the way I always handle these questions is, Ask yourselves, how likely is it that a backup tape is going to need to be restored? If this is something that happens with some regularity, likely you're going to want to have some kind of mechanism in place to take a, create a log, essentially, of all the data that you've deleted or you've edited, for example, under right to rectification, and just create a log. And if you have to restore a backup tape because there's been a disaster, then you're going to have to go back and make all those changes all over again which then really raises the question, if you have to do that with some regularity, you probably want to take snapshots a lot more recently so you don't have a lot of files to edit, as it were, once you restore. In terms of archives, sometimes I get the question, well, we have an archiving system in addition to a backup system. Does it apply to the archiving? Uh, I'd say yes, because the archive really is geared there to provide more ready access than a backup tape, which is really geared for, for disaster. So you're more likely to have right to be forgotten apply to an archive than you would to a backup tape. So again, nothing definitive here. Next bullet we uh, here is what happens when the right to be forgotten conflicts with a document retention law. And this is still an unknown. And occasionally I see people say, oh, well, under GDPR, I can delete this uh, because it's a legal requirement. The problem is with that is that it only applies if the legal requirement under the EU law, not under US law, for example, or any other law outside of the EU. So that's not going to help you. What I always do is when this comes up and this becomes an issue with some regularity, again, because here in the US, we have all kinds of data retention laws. Um, you have EEOC data retention laws. You've got broker-dealer ones for seven years, which are particularly challenging, as you might imagine. So the, the, the net net of it is that Article 17.1c is this idea of arguing overriding legitimate grounds that, hey, we have to keep this. The SEC is going to fine us if we start deleting whole records from someone when they say they want their data deleted. And so this, this is, again, an issue that has come up in many cases. And I typically lean towards using overriding legitimate grounds and saying, look, there's no way we can start just deleting all this data that someone asked because we've got the SEC and that's a bigger issue, quite frankly, than uh, dealing with folks in the EU that are, not, that are unhappy um, with 
for whatever reason, a broker dealer keeping a record of the transaction. So again, this is a very difficult issue. In at this point, it's not easily resolvable. The best thing to do is argue overriding legitimate grounds. Again, that's Article 17.1c. Do take a look at that when you have an opportunity. Abby, any questions before we continue? Uh, no questions at this time. Friendly okay. reminder okay. to all attendees, you can enter questions at any moment in the GoToWebinar console for Scott to answer live on the air. Thank you. Okay. All right. So let's go. So next one. I'm a U.S.-based processor. I don't have any connection to the EU. I'm working on behalf of an EU customer. Am I subject to GDPR? So the short answer is no. I'm going to dig in a little bit more into this in a few minutes. But the short answer is no, but the longer answer is it doesn't really necessarily matter. And that's because of Article 28, sub 3. And what happens is that when you're a processor under GDPR, Article 28, sub 3, which is a laundry list of things that you have to do to comply with GDPR anyway, okay, because you're doing it really as a contract to the controller. And the challenge here is that that list is so long, you might as well subject to GDPR anyway, because you've got so many things that you have to do. So as a processor, you have to essentially hold the same data security standards as everyone else does. So Article 32, same thing. You have to assist the data controller when they need help with data subject access requests, right to be forgotten, all the, the, the chapter three rights that address when people can write in or email and say, hey, change my data, erase my data, find my data, whatever, you have to help with all of that. Essentially, you're subject to all these requirements under GDPR, even though you're not, quote unquote, officially sub subject to it as a controller, it doesn't really matter. So this is the problem is I get this, this with, again, like all these other questions, regularity saying, hey, look, I'm just in the supply chain here. I've got a customer who's a customer of a customer that has operations in the EU. Am I subject to the law? No, you're not, but you are subject to the contract. And the problem is that if something goes wrong, they're going to come and blame you for it if you can't help them. So really, as a practical matter for this, even though you're not subject to GDPR, I would just pretend you are and approach all of your policies and procedures, your operations in the same way. And I use this example sometimes on my presentations here. I had a client that was a bank in the Midwest, it had no operations in the EU, but they had clients that did. And they were processing, they were doing value-added services for the client. They had to be GDPR compliant from soup to nuts based upon the contracts they signed. And I was there to help them get to that compliance state that they felt comfortable with. So the, the challenge is that even though they had no operations, the EU didn't matter, they were by default having to become GDPR compliant. And this is a phenomenon that I saw quite a bit. And I think that we're going to see that as an ongoing theme in GDPR. It's just that there's no way to escape it. Uh, if you do any kind of business that is, is more than local, you're likely going to be captured by this. And now, of course, under CCPA, if you do any business with anyone in California, likely captured by that as well, which is in some ways equally difficult with respect to, to complying with. Um, does GDPR apply to EU-based processors working on behalf of non-EU customers? Yes, it does. So if you're a processor in the EU, you're probably well-versed in the law anyway. But yes, if you have a non-EU customer, then you have to abide by GDPR, even potentially if it's not EU data subjects, but you're processing that personal data of other folks that are from other countries. So keep that in mind as well, saying that they don't have EU data subjects they're processing probably isn't gonna help you very much. Let's go to the next slide. Um, Scott, we do have a question. Yeah, sure. Does encryption of backup data count as the right to be forgotten, specifically the encryption of GDPR data if classified as such? The short answer is I'm leaning towards no, and here's why. If you encrypt something, presumably it can be decrypted, okay? And so as a consequence, I don't believe it's going to check the box for right to be forgotten. Now, you can make the argument that it's so hard to decrypt it basically because only one party can have access to the decryption keys, et cetera, and the chances of it ever getting out in, in a useful form are, are close to nil. You can make the argument that that qualifies as, as, as forgetting someone, but keep in mind why we're, we're trying to, why they came up with right to be forgotten. The whole idea of right to be forgotten is that you don't want data floating around out there that is going to hurt you down the road, okay? The, the archetype case, this is from 
the gentleman in Spain that went bankrupt and for years couldn't get a job or couldn't get credit or an apartment, whatever it was, because on Google was linking to the story that the guy was bankrupt and it, it was essentially a scarlet letter. So as a consequence, this is where this whole idea of right to be forgotten came from. So you can make the argument that encrypting the data doesn't really necessarily change that dynamic. So the dynamic is, are you making sure that that data is not available to hurt that person down the road, especially if it, it's something that is negative. It could be a negative news story or a bankruptcy or medical information that, that's negative, whatever it is. So that's really a larger question to ask rather than does encryption check the box here? I'm not a big fan of using encryption as a way to say, oh, we don't have to report breaches, for example. I know in some cases that's an option. Not a big fan of it because then you you have the onus to say, well, oh, this data was encrypted at the time it was stolen or lost or what have you. Can you, how easy it is to prove that? Because data has to be decrypted at some point in order to be useful. So I'm not a big fan of that. Other attorneys disagree, but I'm just not a big fan of it. So I hope that, I hope that answers that. Okay, a few more questions in relation to sure. the questions that are currently up on the slide. So one of them, they're referring to the second bullet point on this slide, and they're saying that their understanding is that GDPR is applicable to EU residents' data only. So if you can clarify that point, that would be great. Well, it's applicable to EU data subjects, but, and I will go chase down the citation to this, that for non-EU persons, non-EU data subjects, say that you're a processor and, and you're maybe you're processing census data of U.S. Citizens. I'll just give you a little bit of a ridiculous example, but you're a processor in the EU, okay? So all the equipment's in the EU, the servers in the EU, you're processing on behalf of the U.S. government, what have you. My understanding is that that data is covered by GDPR requirements. I will go get a citation for you guys, though, and put that up on the site or on the blog just so that you know that, because that could apply to any data around the world, not just uh, U.S. data. But I remember specifically tackling that issue probably a year or so ago. Okay, great, thank you. Another question pertaining to this, an attendee saying that their company is stating that they will permanently encrypt data. Does the word permanently cover all the bases? Well, I guess the problem is when you say permanently encrypted, does that mean that you're gonna create encryption in a way that you can't unencrypt it? If you were somehow doing that so you couldn't unencrypt it, then yeah, I think that's a way to go. But I've never heard of a situation where something was encrypted permanently into the sense that it was unencryptable. So I'm, I'm a little bit dubious about that. And if you're doing that because you want to address right to be forgotten, it just seems to be it would be easier just to delete the data in the first place. So I'm, I'm a little bit skeptical about permanently encrypting. I guess if there's a way that you would have that and then you would no longer have the decryption key available, depending on how the, the decryption is implemented. I'm just dubious about the whole thing. And maybe this merits its own webcast to talk about just you know, when you need encryption and, and what you can do with it. So it's a good question. Um, I will do a little research on it and um, I'll post that on the blog as well. Okay, one more similar to this. Someone's company is exploring anonymizing personal data when they receive a request to be forgotten. Would that meet the requirement? Potentially, yes. But here's, again, we're back to the same, it's a related issue, and that is that it doesn't take much to de-anonymize de data. Here in the U.S., for example, under DHHS, you have to have a petition come in and say, yep, the way that you anonymize data really makes it anonymous. You've removed enough of these fields. The issue with big data is that it's very good at de-anonymizing data. And forgive me if you all in the audience have heard this already. I did a, a review of the uh, literature last, I think it was last year, on this issue and it's shocking how easy it is to de-identify data or to take just regular old anonymous data and find who you are and again maybe that's a great subject for a webcast too because i almost fell out of my chair when i read some of these reports they were i think privacy international did a really good study on this and it's just so darn easy to de-identify data or take data that was never identified in the first place and find someone's identity and again it's because of big data and the inferences that you can generate so I'm not in love with anonymizing data as a way to meet right to be forgotten. But again, I'll run this to ground and uh, we'll either uh, we'll cover it in the blog or we'll just do another web, a webcast on it because it sounds like it's a popular issue. Okay. 
In regards to some of the questions that you just answered along the lines of encryption, um, they're asking, do we really want to encrypt personal data, such as first and last name, email, date of birth, et cetera, or just encrypt sensitive personal data, only which seems to be more practical? Can you provide some insight on that? Yeah, and this really relates to what I mentioned earlier, is that say that you only encrypt certain things. Now, some things are obvious. I mean, social security numbers or social, social insurance numbers, they're obvious candidates for encryption and being selective about what you, what you don't encrypt. We're back to the same issue of, okay, great, let's look at the things you didn't encrypt. Can we infer identity from those kind of things if the data gets out? And how easy it is to infer it? And maybe I'm being a dead horse here, but it's just remarkably easy to infer a people's identity from very little data. My view on it is if, you're, if there's a, a specific reason why you don't want to encrypt things, either it's slowing down your operations because everything that's encrypted has to be decrypted to be useful. If it's slowing things down and you need to be strategic about what you're encrypting, okay, yep, I get that, and that's a balance. So, but I guess going back to just a philosophical level, if you really are concerned about protecting identity and especially about bad guys stealing it, Encrypting all of the elements is really the way to go. Now, conversely, here's the problem, is that say you license the data to a third party, they're much more likely to be the vector for something bad going on than your own company. So you license it to a third party, they either lose control of it or they do nefarious things with it. That's gonna be the, the scarier of the issues. And so it, that raises the question, how do you scrutinizing those folks and policing them and what they do? This is the Cambridge Analytica problem. So the net net of that is, is that I'm a big fan, if you're gonna encrypt, encrypt everything, but also make sure that your third parties are encrypting everything as well and, and interrogate them and find out just how robust their encryption program is and are they encrypting all the elements as well. It doesn't do you any good if you're very serious about this and your third parties are not, especially third parties you don't have any relationship with directly. Maybe uh, they are arranged through a broker or through another, another third party, it's actually a fourth party you're dealing with. I've dealt with that before. And that's maddening because you can't even talk to these people. So net net of it is encrypt if everything is possible, but um, if you can't be strategic and think about the things that are most vulnerable or most, most likely to be exploited. Okay. Any other questions, Abby, before we roll through the next set? I think we're all set on questions for now. Audience okay. members, feel free to keep typing those into the GoToWebinar console and we'll, we'll ask those as we go along. Thank you. Okay. So I don't have an office in the EU, am I subject to the GDPR? And the answer is maybe. You've got two different tests you can do. One is this idea, are you established in the EU? And it's easy to think, oh, if I'm established, I have an office. I have a subsidiary, I have a branch, what have you. That's not the way they look at it. And so when there was a, a guideline that came out last year, it was good. It could have been great in my view if they addressed more issues, but it was good. And so they have this idea of looking at the link between what you're doing in the EU, what you're doing back home, the processing going on and saying, are they inextricably linked? Meaning that you can't untangle them. That's the test they use for an establishment in the EU. So that's article three, are you established in the EU? And you might think, well, that's as clear as mud, Scott. And the problem is it's a judgment call and you have to ask yourself, are the activities that I'm doing in the EU and all the processing going on back home, are they, are they that tightly coupled that you can't separate them? If so, you've likely got an establishment in the EU, which means that you've got essentially the ability for the authorities to come down on you, okay, as an establishment. Now, there are other ways to do this. There is this idea of are you targeting EU data subjects? And so uh, a lot of the questions I get are about downloading apps. And um, I had this, in fact, in 2018, I had this question a lot about who downloads apps and where and when and are they data subjects? And if so, do they, are they, are, is the app publisher subject to GDPR? Got this all the time. So for example, look at the trigger event. If you are a EU data subject, you download an app in the EU, it's published by, for example, an American company, but it's really geared for people globally. You make a great argument that you're targeting everyone, including EU data subjects, that's the trigger event, and now you're subject to GDPR because you've got their personal information, even if you don't have their name, even if you have all the things they clicked on, all the places they go, what have you. Suppose you are a U.S. tourist and you're vacation in the EU and you're getting a U.S.-centric news app, then, yeah, likely no targeting. 
And I just got back from the EU and I spent a lot of time on my iPhone everywhere, it seems like, using apps of all kinds. And here's the problem. How do you know that you're targeting U.S. folks in the EU for U.S. resources like U.S. news or something like that? It's very difficult to resolve that. As a practical matter, if I'm a U.S. person in the EU and I'm looking at apps in the EU that are published by U.S. publishers, you can make a great argument. I'm an, I'm an EU data subject, and that data that I was looking at is covered by GDPR. I know that's going to make a lot of app publishers unhappy with me, but I think that's the better of the, of the, uh, of the analysis. It's just the way it is, because you don't have to be a citizen or a resident of the EU to be a data subject. If you're inside the four walls, congratulations, you're there and you're a data subject and you're, and you're protected by the law. It's no different if I was there uh, on vacation and I'm protected by consumer protection laws. It doesn't matter that I'm not a resident or a, uh, or a citizen. So that's, I think, the better of the logic. So let's go to the next slide and we'll, we'll dig some more into this. So does GDPR apply to apps downloaded by EU data subjects on vacation in the US? The short answer is likely not. Always look at the trigger event. When did you start the relationship with this person? Was it when they showed up in the US? Say someone from the EU showed up in the US, they start downloading apps and they say, oh wow, this is cool, I wanna use this app while I'm traveling in the US. It's a hotel finder and this is great. Likely not because the trigger event was when they showed up in the US, they downloaded your app, started using it, what have you. Now, you're probably saying, wait a minute, Scott, suppose they put in their personal information, they put in their address. And I know from just looking at the address that these folks from the EU, does that mean that they're covered by GDPR? I still think the better answer is no. Okay? You're not targeting these folks in the EU. You're not offering goods or services into the EU. Okay? So as a practical matter, they show up here, then they download the app. Um, I think that you're good. You don't have to treat them as EU data subjects. Now, here's a, a slightly different scenario. Suppose that someone uses the app. They show up in your hotel, okay? but your hotel advertises in the EU. Now, these persons never saw the ad. Does that mean that they're covered by GDPR? It's a tricky question because now you're offering goods or services into the EU. You're saying, hey, come when you come to America, stay at our hotel. So you're offering goods or services there to EU data subjects. Now, they didn't see the ad. They just showed up to your hotel. Does that mean that they're EU data subjects? I'm going to say that likely yes, because you're already targeting them in the EU. It just happened to be that the ones that showed up at your hotel weren't the ones that saw the ad but you're targeting folks, it's fair to hold you accountable for GDPR. So a related one to this that I've, I got a lot last year was, does it apply to students from the EU attending US colleges and universities? Look at the trigger event. If you're advertising your university to EU folks and saying, hey, come study in the US, apply here, click on this to apply, then you're starting down the road of EU data subject, EU data that you're processing, odds are they're going to be treated at least for purposes of that data as a data subject. Now, what happens when they show up here? They, they decide, okay, I'm going to attend so-and-so university. They show up. Is that data that they generate from that point forward GDPR controlled? And the short answer is we don't know. Um, you can make a great argument. I think the better of the arguments is that if you're using the data that they originally gave you when they signed up, if you're leveraging that data and you're modifying and adding to it, yeah, it takes on the character um, of GDPR control data. And so everything they have then to that point forward is GDPR. You can also make the argument that if you completely separate all that data, put a, a clean sheet of paper, as it were, for all their new stuff, all of that's not covered by GDPR. The practical matter is I don't see anyone taking that level of effort to separate those two. It's just too difficult. And trying to create two different privacy regimes just doesn't work very well. Everyone I've seen try to just has not had a good effect on it. Next up is, does GDPR apply to companies and recruiters outside the EU, nope, don't go just yet, that recruit EU data subjects for jobs outside the EU? This is a different scenario here, okay? Maybe you've got a website in the EU that's recruiting people for jobs outside the EU. So are you offering a good or service? Uh, arguably not. I mean, I don't know if a job would be considered a good or a service. I don't see that as the case. So say you're, you've got no operations in the EU, nothing else, just an, a website ad that says, hey, come, we need someone who can speak language X, come to the U.S. and work for us in this capacity. Is that data then protected by GDPR? I'm going to say no, simply because you're not offering goods or services. Now, you may say, wait a minute, Scott, you're targeting people, but are you offering goods or services? Is, look, look at the trigger event. 
and I don't see that goods or services being being affected. So in that case, I'm going to say as an HR professional, if you did nothing else except put an ad up and invite people from the EU to come work in the U.S., I don't see that as covered by GDPR. Okay. Let's go to the next slide unless there's questions, Abby. Uh, no additional okay. questions at the moment. Additional? Okay. So does GDPR apply to U.S. military bases operating inside the EU? The answer is likely not. Article 23, 1A has a exception for national security and defense. So likely for US, purely U.S. military bases operating inside the EU, likely not the case. So that's the question I've gotten a couple times. Uh, does it apply to diplomatic missions? Different answer. The answer is yes. Article 3 sub 3 specifically says diplomatic missions are covered by that. Um, next question, again, this is one that, that is, is a regular, is if I have an ISO 27K cert or a SOC 2 report, am I in compliance with Article 32? The short answer is not necessarily. Do not rely on that to check the box. And, and here's why. There's a different concept of data protection under Article 32. They have this idea of, of CR. So we're familiar with the CIA triad. They add resiliency to this. So it's not just confidentiality, integrity, availability. They're also incorporating this idea of resiliency so that your system, if internet connected, can take abuse, can take a battering, if you will, from bad actors and state actors and still continue to function, which is a, is a fairly high bar. And I don't know if ISO 27K was really designed with that in mind. This is not just an issue of availability. This is something beyond that. You're having a degree of resiliency that means that your site's going to be withstanding attacks and, and, uh, and perhaps other things as well. It could be designed to withstand just um, negligence. Maybe there are controls in place to catch things like data loss prevention or things like that. But the net net of it is that, that it's a different view on data protection. It's not just the CIA triad. So keep that in mind. You're going to have a higher level to accommodate. And as a consequence, don't presume that ISO 27K or even SOC 2 is going to, is going to necessarily check that box. And there's also this idea of data minimization that gets baked into this. And that's not necessarily something I've seen in ISO 27K. If you disagree, you can, you can write in and, and try and disagree. But the idea of data minimization is that you're not collecting data that you don't really necessarily need. And so this is baked in to this, this idea of Article 32 as well. And in fact, one of the things you'll be surprised about probably is that technical and organizational measures are cited about 20 times, probably at least 20 times throughout GDPR. So whenever you see that phrase, it's Article 32, but it could be in different capacities. It could definitely be in different capacities in the sense that data protection by design and by default. That Half of that is Article 32, half of that is data minimization. So don't presume just because Article 32 is checked that it's checked in all capacities. So really go through GDPR, find where all those citations to technical organizational measures are mentioned, and make sure that the program you've put together meets that standard. ISO 27K is great. It's a multinational standard. I highly regard it. But it's too easy to say, look, we've got this cert. We can check the box. Or we've got a SOC 2 report. SOC 2 reports, they're great. Um, they're used with regularity as evidence that you're in compliance. Okay, And that's great. There's nothing wrong with it. But don't presume that that's going to say, okay, great, we're good with Article 32. It may not be enough, depending on what the report covers. And again, there's still the issues of other capacities where you have to talk about your organizational technical security measures. It's not just Article 32. Okay. Let's go to the next slide. Okay. What happens if there's a no-deal Brexit? And uh, my colleagues at Cordery um, have answered this uh, many times. If you have not seen this presentation they did with us a couple months back, how to recommend it, I've got a link at the bottom. But what they're telling essentially is, is one thing is assume the worst and have a plan B for a no deal scenario. And if that's the case, then start working on it now. Look at all your contracts uh, that incorporate data coming out of the EU and going into the UK, among other places and making sure that you've addressed all the contracts, you've found all the contracts that are, are in scope. Consider which legal bases are most likely for your organization. 
this is an issue that comes up all the time. That is that people will collect data under one legal basis, but not, not understand you need a different legal basis or another legal basis to move it out of a country. So for example, I may collect data on the basis of a contract and I process it, but in terms of moving it out of the country, I may be relying on consent, for example, or some other basis, two separate steps that have to be taken into account. In terms of data transfer vehicles, model clauses are gonna be your most likely candidate. They're the ones that are probably used, I'm guessing, 99% of the time. Some companies have binding corporate rules, and those are great. But in my view, um, I think the better of it, and I think Quartery would agree, model clauses are likely going to be what you're going to be using, which means that you want to go take a look at those contracts now, start getting them ready, and just presume that there's going to be a no-deal Brexit. So uh, I won't steal their thunder anymore. This is something that, I, that if this is an issue for you, there's a link to the, at the bottom that'll talk about this, and I highly recommend you go, go to Quarterly's website. They're great guys. Highly recommend um, their uh, their view on this. Okay, let's go to the next one. Uh, how do we authenticate data subject access requests? This is, of all the problems I have to address, probably the most maddening, and I say that because there's not one standard. There's not one easy way. There's a lot of admonitions on there not to collect more data than you need. Okay, which that's great, doesn't tell me very much so. And just recently, in fact, just I think this month, a really interesting report was just published for the, um, there was a conference in Rome for data protection, and this was published for that. And it's security analysis of data subject access requests and how you authenticate them. It was surprising reading. So for example, four DPAs require a copy of a government issued uh, document to make an access request. Others that were very vague about what they require, which you would think that you would want to get some consensus about what documents you need, but that's not the case. So what I've done in the past is I've always just defaulted to a government-issued ID, um, but if you have a previous relationship with a person, maybe they're a subscriber, and they've already contacted you by email to start the relationship, you can make an argument that, that they're contacting you again from the same exact email address is enough of an authenticator that it's safe to use that um, as a means to say, okay, great, you've been authenticated. I'll answer your data subject access request and, and make changes to your personal data and what have you. So I think that's the, the, the a way to go with this. Again, this is a truly frustrating problem here because there's no definitive guidance. All there are are warnings not to over collect data and not to over authenticate someone and not to make it too difficult. They don't really tell you anything more than that which is, is not terribly helpful. So as a general rule, I always go for government-issued documents. It could be a driver's license, it could be a passport, uh, or do it in combination, maybe something that is an identity document and something that's a location document that shows their, their postal address, like a, a utility bill or something like that. That's what I've done with clients in the past. I think it's probably the least bad of your options until there's a mechanism that allows people to authenticate, maybe through a third party. There's not much more we can do here. So this is just, it's just a frustration. I wish I had a better answer for everyone here, but I'd take a look at that document that I've linked here. I know it's lengthy, but it really gives a good list of how all the different data protection authorities address it. And in many cases, it's not terribly helpful, but I want you to at least see that there's a lot of, of diffusion on what is, uh, is the best way to go with this. Okay. Um, I think we're coming towards the end of things. Yes, we are. So let's talk about data inventories. If you have more questions, send them in. Um, in the meantime, here's why data inventories are so important. And here's a sample here from a real data inventory that I worked on about a year or so ago. I highly recommend that you, if you've not started on your data inventory or haven't updated your previous one, you do so. And here's why. Because states are rolling in now with all kinds of requirements, not just CCPA. Um, there's other states that have come in and are asking things like giving you an opportunity to opt out of transferring your data or having your data sold. Uh, Nevada just passed that law recently. Maine passed a similar one. I'm going to have a webinar on that in a couple weeks, in fact. So we'll talk more about that. But all of these really require you to have a very good idea of what personal data you're processing. Um, there's probably been about seven or eight states that have updated their data breach notification laws this year add more categories of personal information. And again, this is the frustrating thing is that at some point it seems like just about 
everything is personal data, which kind of defeats the purpose of calling something personal data if everything's personal data, but this is where we are right now. So having an adequate uh, data inventory is crucial. So if you've not started on that, please do take the opportunity to, um, to do that. And I think we're almost at the end. Abby, any additional comments, uh, questions that are rolled in? Just that one. Um, okay. Of the available legal basis options, which is the most reliable? I will go with contract. And I say that because you have a piece of paper in front of you that you can look at, or I'm, I'm being metaphorical with the document, that you can look at and say, hey, we've got a contract with this person. We have some kind of legal agreement. That's hard to argue against. Consent is difficult. And here's why, because unless the folks know exactly what they're consenting to and what the implications of that are, you can make an argument that the consent has really been vitiated. Google, the fine they received by the Keneal in January, great example of this where there was about 20 or so different Google sites, you clicked one box that said, yep, I consent to everything. There's no way to know what's really going on there. So I would definitely put contract first, consent second, and then legitimate interest third. And here's why. Legitimate interest is very poorly understood. If you really want to rely on that, I would get your attorney involved and make sure they understand what's involved in it. There's an analysis that has to go through. It, you can't make it self-serving where you say, oh, it's our legitimate interest to, to process this data that's not going to work. So you're going to have to have your counsel do some legwork on this, do some report saying, yes, I've done analysis, and yes, we do have legitimate interest, we can document that. So that's the order in which I would do things. I know it's not a terribly palatable set of options, but it's, it's what we've got right now. There are other options besides those three, but they're going to be very rarely used. There are things like emergencies or things in the public interest. So really, you're stuck with contract, consent, and legitimate interest. Okay, great. Another question is, given CCPA and 15 other states following the same steps like GDPR, should they revisit uh, their data governance and security program holistically, not just one compliance program separately like GDPR? And also, who should own or lead that compliance initiative? Oh, boy, those are two great questions and the, the short answer is yes to the first so yes you should revisit that we call this is, is rationalization it's the idea of looking at the most difficult existing or even upcoming laws and regulations and using them as the benchmark for everything else and you might say gee scott that's going to be more expensive it's going to be it's going to cost more resources and more time more people i agree but here's the deal is that once you've rationalized all those things new regulations that come online aren't going to probably require much more effort, if any, on your part. I mean, here's a great example is that the um, Part 500 regulations that came out for financial institutions, they came out in 2016. They were phased over about two years or so. They really set a very high bar for financial institutions that are doing business in New York. And the definition of financial institutions is huge. It's not just banks. It's mortgage brokers and a laundry list of folks. So that really set a very good standard. Uh, the National Association of Information Commissioners basically copied and pasted that standard and used that for insurance carriers. And that's coming online now. It's in about six states right now. So you're seeing that there are these national quasi standards that you can follow, you can rationalize. And so I would revisit your program. I would revisit it in two big aspects. One is if you've already thinking about doing a certification like an ISO 27K or CSC Top 20 or what have you, now is a very good time to put that forth because you're going to have to demonstrate that you've taken the, the due care anyway, and having that kind of a program is a great way to do that. Also, for Ohio uh, people that are doing business in Ohio, if you do that correctly and stipulate to that, you've got to get out a litigation free card. So by and large, yes, revisit your program, rationalize it, and then answer the second question, who should own it? Really, there's two people that should own this. And again, I think some people are going to disagree with me, but I'm going to say this. Two people need to own this program. The, the, the pure privacy piece of it, the data protection piece of it, dealing with all the legal aspects and licensing and policing third parties, there, someone in legal should be owning that or someone in compliance should be owning that. Okay, So that can be your data protection officer, that could be your chief privacy officer, but someone's got to own that. There's no other way around it. You, just, you have to have someone that can answer all the legalities and can be the one-stop shop for questions that come in. The second person that should own that is going to be your CISO 
or the equivalent. It could be your CSO, CISO, or whatever functional equivalent you have, that person should own that. Why is that? Because a lot of regulations now are mandating that you have a CISO to begin with. Okay, so Part 500 mandates that you have a CISO to begin with. Other states are either implying that you need to have a CISO or come out and saying it. But Part 500 really set the bar very high. And I think it's a great idea because you need someone to be able to, to own the program. And the CISO really should be doing that or a functional equivalent thereof. But yes, those are the two people that need to be involved. And this is based on my own experience. One is going to have the legality and the, and, the, and the experience in the legal realm to be able to address those things. And the other one's going to have the technical uh, acumen to look and see what needs to be done in their own environment. And so those two should work very closely together. That model, that data protection model is, in my view, should be standard at every company of any size. If you're on this podcast you, or webcast, you've probably got at least a billion dollars in revenue and you fit that criteria. Okay. Other questions, Zach? I think those are all the questions that we've received at this time. Okay. So I'd, I'd like to go ahead and say thank you to everyone again for joining us today. A copy of the PowerPoint presentation and a link to the webinar recording will be provided in the coming days. Thank you, Scott, for an excellent presentation. And we hope to see everyone at future webinars. Have a great day, everyone.